The plant-based diet is abundant in nutrients. As long as you're choosing a large variety of fruits, veggies, whole grains, beans, nuts, seeds, tofu, tempeh, all of those incredible ingredients, you're going to get everything that you need. The health benefits that, that I've seen in my patients in the short term and the long term, and what we see in the data as well, show us that, that a plant-rich and even a plant-exclusive diet is brilliantly healthy. Greetings, Internet. Welcome to the podcast. Today, we're back talking diet, talking nutrition, and overall well being with an additional focus on hormone health, particularly, but not exclusively, women's hormone health. And we're going to do it with Dr. Gemma Newman. Gemma is a graduate of the University of Wales College of Medicine. She has expertise in a variety of specialties and serves as a senior partner at a family medicine practice in the UK. She is also the author of The Plant Powered Doctor, a primer on the power of plant-based nutrition to prevent and reverse many common chronic illnesses from diabetes and heart disease to obesity, as well as the science that explains why it works. Gemma first appeared on the show almost exactly three years ago, RRP449. It was quite a popular episode in case you missed it. And today she's back to get granular on the relationship between nutrition and hormones with a focus, but again, not an exclusive focus on women. We talk endometriosis, fibroids, menopause, testosterone replacement therapy, important foods, nutrients, and supplements to best balance our hormones, and many other topics. It's worth pointing out that I learned quite a bit from this conversation. It's not just for the women out there, plenty of valuable information for everybody. So do me a huge favor, take a beat, and quickly hit that subscribe button and notification bell you see right down there in the right-hand corner. Thank you very much, and enjoy this conversation with the wise and wonderful Dr. Gemma Newman. We're here. We're doing it. Yeah. It took a minute, didn't it? It did. You were supposed to come something like six months ago? Yeah. But then... Richard got COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So that got delayed. And then I wasn't sure if you were ever going to make it out. But here you are. I'm so I'm delighted here. to sit with you today. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I really am. I haven't been to LA in nearly 20 years. Mm. So it's been wow. really cool. Yeah. Well, you picked a nice moment. We had some rain the other day, which was very unusual, but everything's uncharacteristically green. Yeah. It must feel very, you know, much like it's, it feels like this is the Ireland time of year. It will quickly turn brown, but right now it's pretty great. It is. I was, we were driving here this morning and I thought, wow, this looks so British. Like, yeah. There's so much green. I know. <laughs> it really surprised yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we did it just for you, Gemma, Thank to make you. you feel at home. I do. Um, and I was trying to remember the last time I saw you, was it at the retreat or was it when I was in London? I can't remember. I mean, everything's a blur because of COVID. Yeah, I think the pandemic changes and warps time slightly. For sure. Probably at the retreat, because I saw you in London between I that and the last time I saw you. I can't remember the order you. of events, the older I get. I don't yeah. remember what came before what. But it's anyway, okay. you are here, lots of stuff to talk about. Um, and because the first time you were on the show, was many years ago and also because it was recorded at the retreat in kind of a fireside format. I think it would be helpful and instructive to just sort of introduce yourself, your background a little bit, and this journey that you've been on that led you to being this advocate for the plant-based lifestyle. Okay. So I've been a doctor now for, oh, 18 years. And I always knew I wanted to be a doctor. I felt that very strongly from a young age. Um, but in my medical training, I, I think it's fair to say I didn't necessarily look after myself. A lot of late nights, a lot of studying. And then when I went into actually being a doctor, again, there was loads of night shifts. And Does anyone look after themselves as a medical student or as a young doctor? I mean, it, it, there's not. really not a lot of room for that. <laughs> probably not. That would be an unusual outlier case, I would think. You're right. I think it would be. And although... There is, I don't know what it's like in the US, but in the UK, you know, there is time for sports and stuff like that, um, sort of recreational stuff. Um, but I didn't really partake of that. I was a real bookworm. And yeah, I partied as well, of course. But um, I, I think it's safe to say that 
my focus was not my health then. Mm-hmm. Like you say, most doctors at that stage don't really focus on health too much, which is ironic. Um, but I felt like when I started work, something had to change because I was exhausted all the time. Um, and I was falling asleep. I was coming home from late shifts. And I thought, I can't be doing this job for the rest of my life whilst feeling this way. So I knew something had to change. And at that time, I hadn't done a great deal of research. Um, I just thought, well, I will calorie count, I will exercise, and I will cut the carbs because that's what the background hum was telling me to do. In med school, I learned about nutritional deficiencies. I learned you know, pathology and anatomy and communication skills and lots of other things, but not a great deal about wellness nutrition. So fast forward, I did brilliantly with that. I got my energy back. I felt great. I was proud of myself. Then I realized to my dismay that I still had risk factors for heart disease. I checked my lipid profiles and they were still raised. And I thought back then that there was nothing I could do about it, that it was just genetic. It was my destiny. And I'd have to cope with that later in life. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward a few years, my husband, Richard, introduced me to your book, Finding Ultra. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was running a marathon. He was doing initially quite badly. He was getting inflamed, injured. And then he decided after reading your book and a few others that he'd go plant-based. And that was my first introduction to plant-based living. Um, I was skeptical. I know we talked about this before, but I, I watched closely with skepticism. He did brilliantly. His next marathon training run, he did like an hour and 10 minutes faster. That got me really interested. Mm -hmm. Not from an athletic point of view. I have done a couple of marathons myself, but I I wouldn't call myself someone that's particularly athletic or focused on performance. For me, it was about my patience. So were were you on board eating that way also in tandem with him or you were just observing him doing that and making mental notes, skeptical mental notes? Yeah, I was observing. Uh (laughs) I didn't actually So two different two different types of of meals happening in the household. Yeah, that's right. He was cooking for himself for a while and I was just watching and uh, learning. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I had already read a little bit about the environmental side of plant-based living um, after he um, introduced me to your book and a couple of others. So I knew that there were some definite environmental benefits to plant-based nutrition, but I didn't have that kick myself. I just didn't feel like I could do it. It seemed too difficult. It seemed, oh, I don't know, a bit pious and not really me. Mm -hmm. You know, I had all these preconceived ideas about what it meant. Right. This will mean that you're going to end up uh, carrying a picket sign, (laughs) (laughs) walking around angry (laughs) with Birkenstocks on. Well, yeah, no, I just, I think for me, I just thought, yeah, there were certain stereotypes that I had contributed, you know, sort of thought about what it meant to be plant-based, what it meant to be vegan. And I felt like that wasn't my identity at that time. So um, he did brilliantly. And I thought, well, if he can do so well, just running a marathon, what could it do for health? Um, What could it do for my patients? I was thinking about heart disease, diabetes, um, cancer, our biggest killers in the Western world. Could it make a difference? And I realized through uh, many years of reading that, yes, it could. I decided to jump in. I did it myself. um, And I reaped the benefits. Um, My cholesterol went down. I used to get a lot of knee aches as well when I was running all through my 20s. That stopped. So, you know, that's my own personal experience. But of course, it's not... um, that's not what I base my practice on. Mm-hmm. I have to read the research as well. Um, but what I found was that it was really beneficial for my patients. And that's when I felt, you know, the magic really happened for me is when I could see with my own eyes um, the changes that my patients had experienced. And that fueled my passion. And I've been really passionate about it ever since. So talk to me a little bit about the transition from you experiencing firsthand the benefits of this, your, your blood panels improving, et cetera, uh, and moving towards uh, then advising or advocating this approach with your patients, because those are two different things. Yeah, they are two different things. And I thought long and hard before I started to talk about this with my patients, because I knew that there would be a burden of evidence, if you like. Like if I was going to be saying something to my patients, I needed to know that what I was saying was evidence-based. And so it took me a lot longer to have the courage really to to start talking about it. But I think what 
many people don't realize is that a lot of the data exists and it has existed for a long time and it actually forms the basis of a lot of guidelines it's just that we're perhaps not consciously aware of that so the world cancer research fund for example tells us that fruits and veggies and whole grains and beans are the cornerstone of a cancer preventing diet you know the american college of cardiology talks about plant-based diets for prevention of heart disease Um, We have the um, American College of Clinical Endocrinologists talk about how it's really helpful for preventing diabetes. Um, And in the UK, we've got the Royal College of GPs. They've got their Green Impact Scheme. So there's actually a lot of um, sort of approval, if you like, from large bodies um, that are involved with disease and nutrition. Uh, But I think still there is that reluctance in a lot of people to to really sort of take it in? Mm, Well, I think there's a couple things. I mean, first of all, there's this notion that um, many medical practitioners have that that, um, lifestyle advice doesn't really land with the patient. Like I can tell them to do it, but they're not gonna do it. So I just need to give them these meds and tell them to maybe not eat so much or, you know, some really general basic stuff. Yeah. Um, but the, the reluctance is from this place of uh, low adoption rates. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. And you have to believe that your patient is capable of change, I think, in order to start talking about mm-hmm. it. And that's hard because nobody likes to be told what to do. And doctors like telling people what to do <laughs> because I think, you know, we've done a lot of training. We want to make things right. We want to help people. So we feel like if only they'd listen to us, then you know, right. they would. I think people want their doctor to tell them what to do though. Do you think so? I think people abdicate too much responsibility to their doctor's advice in oh. general. And I don't know what it's like in, in the UK, but in the United States, um, a general practitioner like yourself only has a few minutes with each patient. And so- there's not enough time to go into great detail on all kinds of lifestyle advice. And there's no kind of follow-up or accountability because those systems aren't in place. It's really just diagnose, prescribe, move on to the next person. And it's not the fault of the practitioner. It's just the way the system is set up. Yeah. Um, do you feel that you, in your practice, like have a little bit more bandwidth to spend time with patients and follow up with them, et cetera, because that piece is so important to all of this. It is important. And it's honestly the reason I went into medicine. And I think that I do have a great advantage if I think about it now, because working in National Health Service, I have a patient list, nearly 3,000 patients. It's actually a really small practice. Um, It's equivalent to one full-time doctor. Mm. So 3,000 people under my care. Um, And... We have only 10 minutes. So yes, you're right. We do have a very short amount of time. It's not a great deal of time to talk about lifestyle. However, we do have the ability to bring people back. We have that sense of continuity um, because it's free at the point of care. Mm -hmm. People don't have to pay anything to see me and people can come and see me as often as they want to. They just need to book an appointment. So it's very, um, I'd say certainly compared to the US, it's very easy to book an appointment. There's still a lot of complaints um, generally in society about how easy it is to get a doctor's appointment. But I think if we compare our healthcare system to the one here in the US, it's much easier. And I'm able to offer that accountability and also um, that support and that feeling of um, care that I think is really lacking perhaps um, when we're dealing with a system where it's very much drugs prescribe next, you know? Right. So yeah, I do think I'd have a lot more freedom in that respect. And that's what I love about it. I love looking after my patients from cradle to grave. Again, it's slightly different where I work because we deal with everything. We, we, we deal with pediatric issues, mm-hmm. obstetric issues, um, elderly care issues, um, everything and anything. People come to us first. Whereas I think here they would m- more likely go to a specialist in their field. Um, it depends. Things. Yeah, it depends. Well, yeah, if you have something acute, you're going to find the specialist. But for the everyday stuff, I feel like a lot of that now is in these urgent care centers that are all over the place. So there isn't, at least from my experience, and I don't know what it's like for most people, but I don't have like a good relationship with a single GP that mm-hmm. I go to see that kind of knows what's up with me. Yeah. It's just if something flares up, I go to urgent care that that needs immediate attention. Yeah. And I think we're seeing the disappearance of that 
patient doctor relationship because of the big HMOs and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I see that happening a little bit in the UK, but I think we still do have a lot more of that relationship. And I've got patients that have been with me. I've been at that practice now for 14 years Mm -hmm. and I've seen people grow up. I've seen families change, um, babies born. Yeah, it's nice. People, yeah, passing away and sort of that whole cycle of life. I've seen it, I've been there for it and I love it. That's why I became a doctor. Mm -hmm. So, So you're going to see a little bit of everything, but I suspect the low-hanging fruit or what you see quite frequently are lifestyle ailments like, you know, certainly obesity, diabetes, um, and heart disease, right? Which are kind of the bullseye problems that a plant-based, plant-centric, plant-predominant diet has shown to be quite beneficial in ameliorating or reducing the symptomology and the underlying causes. Absolutely. And you're right, that's that's the bread and butter really of what I see, mostly high blood pressure and diabetes, um, and cert- certainly in terms of chronic care. But um, you'll be surprised, there's a lot of other things that can also be affected by plant-based nutrition, which we may come on to, but um, I get a lot of people suffering from hormonal health, health issues, mm-hmm. endometriosis, fibroids, period pains, um, menopausal issues. And believe it or not, those things as well can be improved potentially by eating more plants. Um, and other issues, bowel disorders. I get a lot of people with gastrointestinal issues as well. Um, so yeah, there is quite a broad range of things that can be mm-hmm. affected. And it's it's lovely to be able to implement that Um I don't necessarily manage to change the diet of everybody that comes in sure. because people come with their own ideas, their own concerns, their own expectations. But if they're open to suggestions, then yeah, it can be really special. Is it a situation in which now that you have this book out, The Plant Power Doctor, right? Like, oh, she's the plant power doctor. Like if I go in there, she's going to tell me to, you know, eat this way. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that. I'm going to go to this other doctor. <laughs> I don't think I've had that yet. You see, what I try and do with my patients is if they're interested, I'll refer them to my website, which is free. And there's loads of free resources on there. So I don't tend to sell too much. Mm, but you're like, in the media, you're out there. <laughs> people know who you are. Come on. You'd be surprised in my town. I mm. think people don't people don't tend to sign up to me because of that. But a few of my patients have caught on to the things that I'm doing online and they follow me online. So I do have to be mindful of that. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, balancing the the public version of yourself and the daily practitioner version. Yeah, it's hard because you know I think people do have certain expectations of what their doctor should be, mm-hmm. and how their doctor should be. Right. I don't want you going on podcasts all the time. You're supposed <laughs> yeah. to be like in the in the office, like looking at my labs. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, but no, I think I've had mostly, if not all, positive feedback and people have been really inspired and it's been lovely, actually. It's mm-hmm. been a really nice addition to my practice and one that I'll be forever grateful for um, because that's why I wrote the book. You know, it was it was about kind of widening my circle of compassion, making sure that people who wouldn't have otherwise been on my list know about this information in a really accessible way. You know, there's it's full color and pictures and flickable and easy to access and it's got the recipes too. So it's literally, I wanted to make it dead simple. Mm -hmm. Well, you achieved that. It's a beautiful book, so congrats. Thank you. Um, You mentioned hormones uh, a couple minutes ago and and I wanna get into that. Um, People who have been longtime listeners or or viewers of this show uh, know that I've had all manner of whole food plant-based advocates on the program, medical professionals, including two recent appearances by our mutual friend, Simon Hill. Uh, And over the last nine years, I feel like I've covered most of the issues regarding this lifestyle and the role of nutrition and health generally, but one area that I admit to not having covered with any particular focus or intensity is women's health specifically, how this differs from general health advice and the role of food and hormones. So how do we find our way into this topic? I mean, maybe start with some thoughts about when you say women's health, like what does that mean? How is that different from just human health in general? And we yeah. can get more focus from there. Yeah, so I mean, I did do extra qualifications in obstetrics and gynecology, OBGYN, you'd call that here, mm-hmm. and family planning as part of uh, sort of my my work as a doctor. So for a while I worked in family planning as well. And I think it's not that women's health is 
over and above different in terms of nutrition to men's health, but that there are various considerations that we would have physically that that men don't have. Um, now, obviously, the, the most common thing would be the fact that we have periods um, and we are kind of bound by that sort of natural cycle from the age of uh, puberty to the age of menopause. Menopause itself is a huge life transition, which doesn't occur in the same way with men, I think, because primarily because there's less of a fluctuation and a, a sort of um, steep decline in hormones relative, uh, you know, relevant to men's health. It's more of a gradual decline as yeah. opposed to a precipitous one. Exactly. It's much more gradual. And I think that helps to ameliorate symptoms. Whereas for women, going through perimenopause um, up to menopause, then you can actually have wild fluctuations of estrogen. It can go way up, it can go way down. And that's really what, one of the main things that's sort of responsible for a lot of the symptoms that women will get around the perimenopause, mm -hmm. which we can, I suppose, define. Um, but, you know, hormones affect men too, obviously. They affect everybody. There's actually over 50 different hormones and they have to work together in synergy in order for us to perform at our best. And it affects every aspect of our lives, not just puberty, menopause, periods, fertility, but everything, mood, energy, um, our skin. It affects uh, sperm counts, um, all sorts of things. So it's actually integral to all humans, but I'd say for women, there are a lot more considerations, especially around, um, yeah, the fact that we uh, carry children um, and that we have periods and that we have to go through menopause, which are very distinct life phases that do require extra thought and attention, I think. Mm -hmm. And so what is the role that nutrition can play in this and also lifestyle habits? So if we talk first about um, periods, perhaps, because that's probably one of the main things that uh, women will focus on from around about the age of 11 or 12, um, the quality of your periods can change based on the nutrition that you have. So periods are starting earlier, um, which I think is an interesting thing. Um, I don't think that's just because of extra nutrition. Um, I think there are also other factors at play um, with regard to um, environmental pollutants mm -hmm. and things like that. I think there's a lot of reasons why uh, girls are starting their periods earlier. And that's really significant because essentially that means that our our growth is kind of done. Um, we don't tend to get much taller after we start our periods. Um, and I think if you go through puberty and start your periods too early, it can put you at increased risk of actually things like heart disease at a younger age. Oh, I never heard that. Yeah, which is a really interesting thing. Um, and I think there's just a lot of extra hormone exposures in our environment that we haven't been, a been able to consider before. So, Meaning um, like environmental toxins, toxins in skincare products, et cetera, uh, in our foods that are dysregulating our natural hormonal cycles. Yeah, exactly. And things that mimic estrogens in our body, uh, plastics, for example, phthalates, BPA, uh, they have hormone mimicking effects, which I think do affect things like fertility in men, sperm counts, but also potentially also affect when young girls and women start their periods. So yeah, there's a lot to consider now that we haven't really considered in the past because um, they didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in terms of practical things that people can do, increased fiber is so important. Uh, main reason being that if you're um, constipated, you're actually potentially recycling unwanted hormones through the body. Hormones that you would have otherwise got rid of, um, you're actually reabsorbing. So trying to make sure that young girls and, well, children and everybody in general doesn't get constipated mm -hmm. is quite a good way of reducing our excess hormone exposure. Um, I think it's important to mention that, you know, our fat cells in our body are also hormonally active. They can um, produce estrogen. So if we have more of those, then we also have more exposures to estrogen as a result of that, which can affect men as well as women. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's a really important thing that again, is not necessarily talked about much. The fact that our fat is also hormonally active yeah. too. Um, and 
yeah, so I think fiber is a really important thing. Um, it reduces our hormone exposures. It helps us to produce short chain fatty acids, which also are great for helping our hormone regulation, um, feeding our gut microbiome, which is important as well for hormone regulation, which is also important for our immune system, which affects our hormone regulation. So all these things are linked. Wait, you're saying it's all related? I have. <laughs> yeah. I had uh, Dr. Dr. B in here the other day. Going, going deep on fiber once again. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, and his whole thing about, you know, eating 30 different plants and setting that as a goal and the importance of fiber for any number of things and just how critical it is. In this conversation, it, it tends to get lost. We focus on macronutrients or protein or, you know, uh, our omega-3s, all of which are important, of course, but most people, are fiber deficient? Like where's the, again, back to the low hanging fruit, like what is the quickest, easiest change that you could make that could have the biggest impact and increasing the fiber in your diet seems to have just a multiplicity of downstream health benefits. It does. And you know, there was a study, uh, I think it was actually led by Dr. Neil Bernard, um, looking at how this could affect people in their periods. Um, and they had a two month um, cohort of women um, half were on a healthy plant-based diet, the other half were a control group, and they wanted to see, could it affect their periods? And what they discovered was that it did make um, a statistically significant difference in the length and the, the heaviness of the women's periods. And also- Just they, by increasing fiber. Yep, wow. just by increasing fiber. And it also showed um, a raised SHBG, uh, sex hormone binding globulin, which is an important protein that essentially holds on to hormones until we need them. It's kind of like a storage molecule, if you like. And what's interesting is it was able to increase that for the women who are consuming a healthy plant-based diet, which is important because that can help regulate their unwanted hormone exposure mm -hmm. as well. And is that a function of just an increase in plant foods and by definition, an increase in fiber, or is there an aspect of that that has to do with the removal of the, the uh, meat and dairy products? It could be a bit of both. So this is postulation based. So that study didn't say specifically why, but we know that fiber is so crucial for reducing uh, recycling of hormones, as I mentioned, but also meat and dairy does have a role to play with regard to hormone exposure itself. So. You know, when we consume dairy, we're consuming the milk from a cow who's been uh, pregnant and obviously is lactating, which has extra hormones, bio uh, equivalent hormones mm -hmm. to human hormones. Um, but also in the meat that we eat, um, with, there is some hormonal exposure there as well. But also, interestingly, I think, is that meat is one of the main ways that we get um, potential for microplastics exposures, which are also affecting our hormones. Um, I think in the UK, phthalates are highest in fish. In the US, phthalates are highest in chicken. Um, and there is some data to show that there was an association between increasing meat consumption and increasing um, mm. endometriosis symptoms. So and maybe, signs maybe, maybe and define phthalates and then endometriosis. I'm not sure I even know what endometriosis is. Oh, okay, so let's do a little backtrack. Endometriosis is a condition that could affect up to about 10% of women. And it takes many years often to diagnose because the women who are suffering from endometriosis just think that perhaps they've got really heavy periods. Um, but it's so much more than that. So what it is, it's where the womb lining tissue, uh, which normally just grows in the lining of the womb and is shed once a month with your period, starts to grow in other parts of the body. We don't know why this happens, it predominantly happens in the pelvis. So you get that tissue that grows in the lining of the womb in other parts of the pelvis, often sticking perhaps to bowel or to the bladder. Um, and But it, interestingly, you can get endometrial deposits anywhere, even in the brain very rarely, or in the lungs. Mm. And the problem is when you have your monthly bleed, those uh, cells will also bleed. And when they do, they cause irritation and inflammation. So no matter where they are in the body, they start to bleed? Yeah, they wow. will bleed. And it can cross the blood brain barrier. Yeah, it's very rare. Um, but yeah, it's mostly around the pelvis or you know deposits perhaps on the outside of the womb. Um, but the problem is that inflammation and irritation then causes um, a lot of pain. 
and it can cause parts of like the bladder or the bowel to stick together. It can affect fertility. It can cause painful sex. Um, it's, you know, it's a really sort of far reaching condition. And, you know, if women are suffering from horrendous period pains, you know, nausea, vomiting, have to take days off work, painful sex, problems getting pregnant, this is not normal. And they have to go to the doctors because many people will think, oh, it's just my period. But mm -hmm. interestingly, you know, periods, periods can be really painful, um, more painful than a heart attack, actually, in some, some research tells us that wow. they, that the pain of having a period, because um, it's because of the prostaglandins that are produced by those womb lining cells. So, you know, when you're having a bleed, these prostaglandins that that cause contraction of the of the womb, that's what causes the pain um, and the you know the, the cramping, the, the cramping, mm -hmm. um, those sort of feelings of nausea. If it gets in, if the prostaglandins get into the bloodstream, that's what causes you to have things like diarrhea and vomiting, nausea. It's it can get really bad, and I think you know women don't always sort of know how to advocate for themselves you know people think oh it's just her period well actually for a lot of women they really do suffer mm. um and especially when you have endometriosis which is a whole other condition related to your periods um but causing so many more complications so so it yeah. goes on it goes undiagnosed often because yeah. people just think you're having a severe period episode or you're ignored and just consider to be normal yeah so, so you know either doctors will think oh she's just having a heavy period i'll give her some painkillers or she'll think oh i'm just having a heavy period i'll just have to wait a few days later it'll be okay but for some women you know it's completely life-changing and you know, it can have a huge impact and as i say up to 10 percent of women have this condition and is there a test for it and then once it's diagnosed how is it treated so this is why it's hard to diagnose because the main way of doing so is through a laparoscopy. So you have to have an operation essentially to see those deposits, which are usually in the pelvis. Right, which no one's going to do unless it's so severe. Exactly. So people will try and you know muddle through. They might take some painkillers and you know hope for the best. But actually, it's really important to get that diagnosis because once you have a diagnosis, um, one of the main ways of treating it is is um, to actually kind of blast those little deposits, burn them off, and that can help to improve fertility and pain. Um, but I would love for women to know that diet and lifestyle can have an effect on endometriosis as well, a positive effect. Mm -hmm. And having a healthy plant-rich diet could improve symptoms um, greatly. Uh, so yeah, I, I would love for, if, if there's one message for this part of the podcast, it would be for women who have endometriosis to know that hopefully if they have a more plant-based diet, they could see some improvement in their symptoms. Mm, interesting. Um, but they don't, quite know what causes it and there isn't any kind of like simplistic cure no there's no simplistic cure um but i suspect that our extra hormone exposures in the modern world play a part um just because as i said there's an association there between uh, the consumption of certain animal products and uh, the development of further endometrial deposits and we don't yet know i'd love for there to be more research it's the same with fibroids mm -hmm. i would love for there to be more research into fibroids well let's talk about that define what fibroids are okay so fibroids are essentially growths in the womb and they are estrogen dependent so much like endometriosis which is um in a way fueled by estrogen exposures so is um, the um, development of fibroids. And um, you can get extra painful periods again with fibroids without realizing it. So you'd be thinking, oh, I've just got a heavy period. But actually the reason that you've got it on this occasion is because your fibroid mass, the lump, is, is pushing against the womb lining, which is causing it to increase in the surface area. Then it bleeds more, mm -hmm. then the period is heavier. So not all fibroid lumps push into the womb lining. Sometimes they can grow on the outside of the womb or in the middle of the womb. But for the ones that push onto the womb lining, they, they cause extra heavy bleeds. And you know, if the fibroids get big, then they also have just a mass effect in the pelvis, which can you know, affect you know, the way that you pee or the way that you're able to pass motions. So it can have other downstream effects as well. Um, and again, I would really love to see more research into the causation and amelioration of fibroids, but suffice to say, in terms of lifestyle, there are some things that we've seen could be associated with it. 
Um, again, we come back to the meat consumption. Uh, that can have an impact on the growth of fibroids, perhaps because of the extra estrogens or um, plastics that we're exposed to. Mm. Alcohol is another one that has been associated with fibroids. Um, uh, physical exercise has been something that's potentially been associated with less severe fibroids, but we just have association data really. So um, I'd like to see more of it. Mm. And is there a test to know whether you have fibroids or if you have them, you just know it? You don't just know it, unfortunately, but you can get a scan. It's much easier to diagnose fibroids because mm -hmm. you can just, you can arrange for an ultrasound scan and you'll be able to see those lumps there. Sometimes with a scan, you can see what could be endometrial deposits. So if you have an unusual appearance to your ovaries, uh, it could be something called a chocolate cyst because um, you get sort of dried old blood then on the ovary itself, which looks like, you know, a, a sort of a, a dark mm. cyst. And you can sometimes because see those. Because those cells have bled. Because they've during bled. During the period. Yeah, yeah wow. exactly, exactly. Um, so you can kind of get a, a hint of endometriosis through a physical exam, um, if you know if your if your primary care physician or your OBGYN has done a an internal exam, you can sometimes get a feel for whether there's endometriosis there based on um, whether the womb or the ovaries feel fixed when you do an internal exam, and you can again maybe get a hint of it with an ultrasound. But the only way of truly diagnosing endometriosis is with a laparoscopy. But fibroids is much easier because you only really need to scan. Mm. And the appropriate lifestyle interve interventions for fibroids look like what? Well, I'd say really focus on whole foods, healthy, plant-rich diet, number one. Uh, you'll be increasing your fiber. So as I said before, reducing your, your hormone exposure from your own body. Um, you'll be hopefully helping yourself to potentially reduce any excess weight um, and you be avoiding um, xenoestrogens from plastics exposures um, as well. So that would be the main thing I'd say. Exercise is important. Um, interestingly, uh, there's some research to show that certain things are great for reducing the pain of periods, which can affect endometriosis and fibroids. So uh, ginger and turmeric have been shown mm. in a couple of studies to be really helpful in reducing the um, amount of prostaglandins that are being produced at the lining of the womb. So, I mean, essentially, if if we kind of figure out this is this is why um, oral contraception can help periods actually, because oral contraceptive pills um, reduce the amount of endome endometrial lining cells that are produced, which then reduces the prostaglandins, which which is what causes the pain mm -hmm. and the cramping. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so contraceptive pills can help with the pain. Anti-inflammatory painkillers can help with the pain for the same reason. They reduce the prostaglandins. But if we want to go sort of down um, a sort of a, a lifestyle route, then ginger and turmeric have been shown in studies to have the same benefits as anti-inflammatory painkillers for reducing period pains. So on some level, this is uh, a, a disease of inflammation or a disease that's exacerbated by exposing the body to inflammatory foods and um, environmental factors, right? So yeah. it would follow logically then that a diet that is anti-inflammatory in nature, I mean, it's good for everything, right? Um, would be particularly good at ameliorating the symptoms of, of these conditions. Yes, I think so. And if we look at other hormonally driven things, so not just endometriosis and fibroids, but also polycystic ovaries, again, it's another condition that affects fertility, affects our periods, um, but can also be improved using lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's not something that tends to come up in these kinds of conversations, but PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is very much like diabetes in that it's driven by insulin resistance. Mm. And insulin resistance can be improved by using whole plant foods, eating a much more whole food plant-based diet. And so, yeah, that's another condition that could potentially also be improved using lifestyle uh, and have long reaching benefits. Sure. So increasing your fiber, turmeric, ginger, what are some of the other anti-inflammatory foods that top your list? Well, we've got to go for like berries, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, tofu, tempeh. I think 
Uh, soybeans have a terrible reputation still, unfortunately, but they are really good for hormone regulation um, because not only do they contain all essential amino acids, but um, they also uh, they contain a special kind of um, phytoestrogen, which is actually beneficial. So it's it's actually um, more of a, a modulator uh, rather than something that is an active. A pusher of estrogen, if you like. Right. Um, so let's let's like really underscore that because I think what happens is people hear soy, they think estrogen. You spoke earlier about dysregulated estrogen causing these problems. So without further inquiry, it would appear that eating something like soy with these uh, with these estrogen compounds would be not a good thing, right? So like, be I want you to be like really clear about soy estrogens, phytoestrogens, the differences. Okay. <laughs> so soy contains phytoestrogens or estrogens, um, but it's actually what we call a SERM, a selective estrogen receptor Right. Modulator. And if you're British, you say estrogen. Yes. yes. Sorry. Keep going. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> My estrogen. Um, so it's selective in its action. So if you, um, so, so what it does is if you are wanting to reduce your risk of breast cancer, it's really great for that because it blocks the receptors um, that are responsible for um, you know, breast cancer. If you want to improve your bone health, it's actually really good for that because it's more uh, likely to selectively bind to the receptors that um, are in the bone area of the body. So it has selective effects which are actually beneficial in terms of our hormone exposures. It stops us from being exposed to bioequivalent hormones and instead blocks those. So it's good for redu uh, reducing risk of breast cancer, especially if you start to eat soy products young in life. So for you know young girls, teenagers, young women, there is some evidence to show that if you have soy products in childhood and adolescence, it's much more likely to reduce your risk of breast cancer later in life. But if you're a dude or a mate and you get on the soy early, you become a soy boy and develop man <laughs> boobs. Well, you're probably more likely to develop man boobs if you drink actual cow's milk, if you think about it, because that's a bioequivalent estrogen. But in actual fact, there is data to show that soy can potentially reduce the risk of prostate cancer. So you don't need to worry too much about soy. Right. Or in fact, you don't need to worry at all about soy. <laughs> is there a difference between um, soy uh, or tofu versus... Um, like tempeh or a fermented soy. Like I've always understood that a fermented version is is better. Yeah, I think there are different uh, qualities, I suppose. Um, interestingly, soy products have been shown to be beneficial for um, flushes, sort of period flushes, vasomotor symptoms in women. Um, so yeah, but in, in sort of Japanese populations, they don't really have the same amount of flushing. And it's thought to be because they have a lot of fermented soy products, sort of miso and mm -hmm. tempeh and um, you know, edamame beans. And um, not that that's fermented, but it's a more natural form of soy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think if you go for minimally processed sort of tofu, tempeh, um, edamame beans, miso soup, that kind of thing, you're going to have um, perhaps even better benefits. But yeah. What about natto? Have you had natto? I've not had it, but I've heard it's disgusting. <laughs> I, I've heard that as well. It's atop the list though of like the most nutritious yeah. fermented soy product. And yeah. it's an acquired taste that they enjoy in Japan, but is not necessarily readily available in the West. No, I mean, yeah, maybe I'll try it one day, but I haven't tried it yet. It's it's sort of the the soy version of, dur of, of durian, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> But actually durian's delicious. Yeah, but it's an acquired taste. I mean, durian's a hardcore thing. Yeah. I mean, the people that love it really love it. Yeah, but no, it's, it's, it smells quite strong though, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure, for sure. But I actually wanted to say before we get off the topic that interestingly, going back to uh, the Gut Health MD and his uh, passion for the gut microbiome, the effect of soy um, on flushes and things like that can be affected by our microbiome or estrobilome. So some people, unless we have the gut bugs to um, sort of process the genistein from the isoflavone in soy, we may not necessarily get the same flushing benefits, mm -hmm. which is why it's great then to have an overall plant-rich diet because what you're doing there is you're promoting the kind of gut bugs which would then hopefully be able to metabolize 
the um, the components of soy that benefit us in terms of vasomotor flushing. Right. So if you have some form of dysbiosis, that could be a causal factor in a dysregulated, um, not uh, a dysregulated hormonal state, and also a dysregulated period, right, or some kind of period issue. Yeah, potentially. So yeah, I'd say the bottom line is that plants are always good in terms of hormone regulation. Uh, and they can help to foster the microbiome that could potentially then also use other parts of plants to then benefit us. Mm. How do you think about when, you, when you're advocating a plant-based lifestyle, how do you think about the difference between a plant exclusive diet versus a plant predominant diet? As somebody who's seeing a lot of patients and for many, I suspect this is like a new idea. Um, how do you communicate around that? And what is your kind of general position on that? Yeah, my general position is I just want people to eat more plants. And I don't tell my patients to go vegan because I think we do have a lot of data that you can have a very healthy plant-rich diet without necessarily going 100% vegan. I am somebody that, that identifies as vegan, but it's not something that I would say my patients have to do. I think that um, from what I've seen, the more plants, the better. And we see that in the data as well. The more plants we eat, the better. So it doesn't have to be plant exclusive, um, but plant predominant is definitely important mm -hmm. for overall health. And I just, you mentioned sort of low hanging fruit earlier. That's kind of how I feel about it right now. You know, only 8% of what most of people in the Western world eat is fruits and veggies. You know, it's more than 50% processed foods. So if I can get people more on those fresh whole plant foods and less on the processed foods, then mm -hmm. that's a win. So yeah, that, that's how I tend to advocate for it at work with my patients um, because not everybody's going to feel 100% ready to just dive in. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Have you had any patients come to you who are on the carnivore diet? I haven't, no. Is that I, I a thing think, in the UK? Because you know it's what? like quite a thing here in the States. I know it's a big thing here. And it's getting more popular in the UK. But you know what? If I'm honest, I've only really seen it in online and in wellness circles rather mm -hmm. than in my actual patients. Mm -hmm. I think instinctively most people feel that having a meat exclusive diet could cause long-term issues. <laughs> <laughs> so How dare you? I'm sorry to say. <laughs> no, but I think, yeah, it's not been something that I've actually experienced in my patients. But it's a tough one because... In my practice, I never like to say to people that they're doing something that's wrong because we all have different paths to health. Having said that, oh, it's really hard. It's really hard because you know people sometimes feel great on a carnivore diet to start with. You know, they may have got rid of a lot of health issues that they were having in the past. And for me, I think that probably comes down to a fairly um, strict uh, exclusion diet. You're basically taking everything out, mm -hmm. um, which is fine for short term, but it's not really something that you could consider long term health. Yeah, that that argument gets used against the plant based diet as well. Like, oh, you feel better when you went plant based because you just got off all the processed foods, but it's not sustainable, and over time you're going to be nutrient, mineral, and vitamin deficient. Yeah, it's a shame that people say that about plant based diets because. The way the way I see it, based on the research, is that you know the plant based diet is abundant in nutrients. Um, as long as you're choosing a large variety of fruits, veggies, whole grains, beans, nuts, seeds, tofu, tempeh, all of those incredible ingredients, you're going to get everything that you need, um, except the B12. Um, but again, I think. The, the health benefits that, that I've seen in my patients in the short term and the long term, and what we see in the data as well, show us that, that a plant-rich and even a plant-exclusive diet is brilliantly healthy. Mm. What about the argument, I'm sure you've seen this at least online, that plants are toxic, that they have toxins that they've developed as natural defense mechanisms, and that makes them um, intolerable to the human body. Have you heard that one? I've heard that one online again, not with my patients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's I think a lot of extreme ideas tend to come from online spaces and perhaps I don't know why that would be, but I think if we if we look at the properties of plants, yes, they do have certain um sort of phytonutrients that we benefit from, but the toxins idea I think is actually something that is really damaging because often it's those plant so-called toxins that provide us with 
really important factors for our own health because our bodies can use them in ways that actually help us to support our microbiome and our immune systems. Um, so I think that's the difference between perhaps mechanistic data and actually seeing what people do in real life and seeing what they eat in real life for longevity and health, which are two sometimes completely opposed ideas. When everything comes together, when mechanistic data and observational data and randomized control trials all come together pointing to one direction, we can feel a lot more confident. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we're just looking at a single trial or a mechanistic trial on an animal, for example, we're not gonna really have the same picture. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So, because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious, and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. Let's talk about menopause. Yeah. So what is it and what can women do who are experiencing it um, reduce the, the, the symptomology around it? I'm actually really glad to talk about menopause because I think it's something that many women feel that they can't talk about. It's weird. It's like this weird, like it happens to every woman, right? But it's yeah. this sort of not really shameful, but like something that, oh, we just don't talk about it. Yeah. And I try to think about where that comes from. I do think that we live in a patriarchal kind of society that really values women for the way that they look more than the way that they contribute to the world. And I think a lot of women feel that if they talk about menopause, that their significance in the world is diminished somehow, that their function to produce children um, is is gone, therefore their worth is gone. That's that's something that I've noticed a lot, um, certainly in my patients, but also in general society, that people feel really um, reluctant to speak up about it and um, quite low about it. Like it's it's something that, that a lot of women feel uh, that they've lost something about themselves. And I'd really like the conversation to change because I think that if we can have an empowering idea about what menopause can do, then it can hopefully help women to, to actually feel that they're even more um, contributing to the world in ways that they couldn't do before. You know, there's only very few mammals that, that have a menopause. This mm -hmm. is really interesting. Um, there's three mammals that experience menopause. Obviously humans are one of them. Do you have any idea what the other ones could be? Well, I would think it would be chimpanzees or apes. You'd think so. Right. But actually it's not. Don't tell me it's dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> really? Yeah. Whales? It's Yeah, it's orcas and pilot whales. Wow. Orcas, pilot whales, and humans. That's the, so bizarre. I would yeah. have just presumed that every mammal, every, every female mammal experiences that. No. And this is significant because what it tells us, I believe, is that we have a very specific purpose pa past our reproductive years. You know, we have a very specific um, survival advantage in having a menopause, whereas every other mammal does not. And there's actually something called the grandmother hypothesis, which essentially tries to explore this. And the idea is that 
you know, the reason that humans have menopause is because uh, women in society um, have such value in, in making sure that we continue as a species. You know, we maybe look after younger children. We mm. would bring families together. We would bring communities together. Um, there's a very strong survival advantage to having women exist past their reproductive years. Mm. And I think that should be celebrated because it's something very special. So, yeah. Right, the idea that evolution has has prioritized this because when the village expands and there's more women around to caretake for the many young ones, then everybody benefits as a result. Everybody benefits and there's a survival advantage. But you advantage. would think that would, that would be the case with chimpanzees and apes and all other manner of mammals as well. Yeah, you'd think so. But it's interesting because when you look at pilot whales and orcas, they have a very matriarchal society, don't they? They, mm. they go around in matriarchal pods and it's the grandmother that makes sure that the mother and the babies are all together and protected. So, right, yeah. so we're off the rails here being a patriarchal <laughs> society, we're right? We are, we're, we are evolutionarily meant to be a matriarchal society. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. I think so. <laughs> That's my hypothesis. Uh -huh. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this occurs in, in, in every woman at a certain age uh, and it can, um, you know, the, the symptoms range in yeah. severity. They right? do. And that's another interesting thing is the symptoms can range in severity based on where the woman lives in some, to some degree. So, you know, that I mentioned Japanese women and vasomotor flushes. I mean, that's one of the main symptoms for uh, women, certainly in the US and the UK is um, hot flushes or flashes. Yeah. Uh, whereas interestingly, Japanese women don't tend to experience that. Um, there was some anthropology work done um, in certain, or two provinces of India that showed that menopause brought about increased quality of life in those women because they were um, able to achieve more status. They were able to spend more time with men. They had um, uh, they had more of a say in the household over the sort of the sons and the wives and other younger children. So in actual fact, when there were sort of um, questionnaires to those women, they had an increased quality of life and far less menopausal symptoms. Than but what is the, I'm trying to understand what that's attributable to, the increase in quality of life. Yeah, I think that a lot of the symptoms of menopause can be dreadful, but also that um, the society in which we live, if it's more supportive to women going through menopause, can dramatically reduce um, the effect on our lives. So um, when you have um, a society that is supportive or where the woman is considered to be um, a value, wise, contributing, then um, it can be actually quite empowering mm. and it can hopefully potentially lead to less in the way of symptoms. That's not to say that it's all psychological. No, there's some very physical and very real problems. But I think it's important to just be aware that in society and the way that we view women is really important because it can affect our long-term happiness. It can affect the way that we feel we can contribute to the world. And that can also affect the symptoms that we experience much with any kind of medical or health condition. That's fascinating. Yeah. That the social environment and a supportive social environment can can have that kind of impact. Yeah, and or it's it true. it seems to appear that that's the it case. Seems to, yeah. It seems to appear that way. And it's true for all sorts of things. Uh, you know, there was a really interesting study that showed that it, people who had increased happiness scores, uh, uh, positivity, a good sense of humor, their longevity was increased even when they were living with chronic disease. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think the importance of a supportive community shouldn't be underestimated, which is why opening up this kind of conversation is really important so that men and women can understand how to support the third of women that are right now peri or, you know, post-menopausal. It's, sure. it's huge. So, sure. So yeah. Um, I mean, that dovetails into the Blue Zones discussion and the importance of connectivity and community and, 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 and also, of course, like holistic health, like how we yeah. think about these things, which we can put a pin in, but sorry, I interrupted you, continue. Yeah, no, well, I was just gonna sort of start talking about some of the symptoms, which mm -hmm. again, are not that well known apart from the flashing or the flushing, right. because women don't tend to talk about it too much. But yeah, I've been married to Julie for over 20 years. And I know about the occasional hot flashes, but beyond that, like I, I'm probably like a lot of guys, like I don't, I don't really know what's going on. Yeah, 
Well, it's, it's, it's okay, but it's good that you can be more aware and hopefully mm-hmm. we can sort of uh, expand on that now and all the men who listen to your podcast can hopefully... Right, I mean, I want to... Yeah, be, this is about women's health, but it's also about like helping men understand these things so that they can be more empathetic to their partners if they're in partnership with women um, and learning how to like communicate around it in a positive manner. It's true. In fact, I... I think that Rod Stewart said that um, if more men knew about menopause, there'd be far less divorces. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so do tell. So I will. So we've got the vasomotor flushes, which can be really debilitating for some women, uh, where you just have this tremendous heat going through your body, mm-hmm. top to bottom, um, sweat like crazy. Um, it tends to happen a lot at night as well, but it can happen at any time of day. Vaginal atrophy is a big one. Um, and it doesn't just mean that that you have soreness or um, uh, some, some sort of dryness there. It can actually be quite severe for some women. Um, so vaginal atrophy occurs when your estrogen levels are going down and it can cause painful sex and dryness, but also it can cause um, severe burning, itching, like it can hurt to sit down. Um, it can... It can if you had an episiotomy scar when you were from when you were giving birth, they can sort of come open, they can split and bleed. Like it can be a really severe problem that again is very little talked about, but mm. can really impact the quality of life. Uh, mood changes can be quite severe. Increased anxiety is very real. Um, and many women will put it down to, oh, I'm just depressed. They may think that they need an antidepressant, but actually it could be that the hormone changes around menopause are responsible for some of those changes in mood. Body aches. This is a really interesting one. Many women don't realize that severe bone and muscle pain can be attributable to those hormonal changes. Up mm-hmm. to 30% of women going through menopause get body aches, but they won't always attribute it to those changes in hormones, which is another big mm-hmm. one. Um, dry skin, dry eyes. Some women only experience severe dry eyes, which can again be very debilitating. You know, ever having to use drops, not being able to see properly. Um, it, can, it can actually really impact quality of life as well. Um, low libido, your sex drive can sometimes go down. Understandably, if you have vaginal atrophy, but sometimes there are other things attached to that as well with regard to um, identity and you know mm-hmm. feelings of worth and attractiveness to your partner. That there's all sorts of other things that can sort of uh, play a role there. Um, so yeah, there's quite a lot of different symptoms. Um, you are more likely to get constipated because there are estrogen receptors. Uh, that are in the gut. So you have reduced gut motility, which then has an impact on, again, um, your hormone regulation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, Because of the lack of estrogen, your body tries to come back to balance. And so you get metabolic changes as well. In the Western world, about 65% of women have obesity because of the way that the fat deposits more around sort of the center of the body. Um, as a way of trying to compensate for the lower estrogen that's being produced by the ovaries. Mm. Because as we talked about earlier, fat cells can produce estrogen. So again, that these are things that a lot of women don't necessarily realize are related to those changes in hormones. Bone loss. So unfortunately, from about 40 onwards, we'll lose about half a percent of our bone mineral density. But when you go through menopause, that drops precipitously. Uh, many women will lose about 20% of their bone mineral density in the first five to seven years after menopause. Wow. And that causes you that's increased risk of fractures. Yeah, that's that's very significant. It's, yeah, it's really significant. So I think that this is a public health issue. And I think that if more women knew that the time around menopause can be a time of empowerment, uh, then they could actually potentially prevent further problems. So HRT or HRT is something that, again, we don't tend to talk much about, Mm -hmm. but is a really important- Hormone replacement therapy. Hormone replacement therapy. It's a really important thing to open up a conversation around because it's one of the number one treatments to ameliorate a lot of these symptoms in women who are eligible and who want to, um, and including things like bone mineral density loss and heart disease risk as well. And I think there's a lost generation of women who felt that it was too dangerous to even consider HRT. Mm. And in those women, I think, you know, there's a huge injustice that has been done there because HRT as a hormone um, replacement model 
is a great way to ease that hormonal transition rather than going through all those fluctuations you're you're replacing a lot of the hormones that you would have otherwise lost mm -hmm. and you're um, maintaining your bone mineral density uh, you can improve a lot of the bone ache issues uh, you're actually reducing potentially your risk of heart disease as well but there is a window of opportunity with regard to heart disease risk and that's like around the menopause like if if you're within 10 years of menopause or less than the age of 60 that would be a good time to um, reduce your risk of heart disease moving on in life. Um, and the same with the bone mineral density loss. There's that window of opportunity there in that sort of five to 10 year window between sort of, you know, 45, 50, 55, where if you are eligible, it's worth at least exploring the idea of HRT. Right. Okay. So with that in mind, then what, wait, hold on a second. Let me collect my thoughts before I start. We were talking about um, HRT, weren't we? Right. So with that in mind, how safe or unsafe is HRT in general now? And what are the factors that determine whether a woman is a, is a good candidate for this? Yeah, so there will be certain women that are not eligible for HRT, uh, primarily those who've experienced breast cancer. Uh, but there are other potential reasons why they wouldn't want to have HRT as well. Um, obvious things like pregnancy or um, a recent blood clot or an undiagnosed bleed, for example. But in actual fact, I would say excluding those women, most women would be pretty good candidates for HRT. Mm. Uh, the main problem that really scared a lot of women back in sort of 2002 uh, was the uh, Women's Health Initiative study, which showed that uh, there was a potential increased risk of breast cancer. In fact, the study was halted early over concerns about excess breast cancer risk. And unfortunately, the headlines around that study went around the globe and made the um, uh, use of HRT dropped by about 66%. In other words, the headlines being something along the lines of HRT will cause breast cancer. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it scared, it scared everyone. It scared doctors, it scared women who were taking HRT. So many women stopped taking it. But interestingly, Professor Langer, who was one of the main investigators as part of the study, wrote a paper condemning the headline of the study as being irresponsible and wholly inaccurate. And many of the lead investigators on that study were not consulted before it was even published. And one of the main problems with the study was that they used women aged 65 or thereabouts, and they mm -hmm. were starting HRT brand new. And of course, by that stage, a lot of those risk factors for breast cancer and excess risk of heart disease, for example, were already in existence before they began the treatment. Mm -hmm. And it's, I do believe it's let down a whole generation of women there was a really interesting study in the BMJ from 2012 that showed that uh, if you take HRT for a period of five years, um, you actually have reduced risk of heart attacks and heart failure. There was no increased risk of breast cancer or blood clots at all. And there was an interesting study by David Katz, actually, mm. in 2013. And he estimated that in the 20 years after 2002, uh, that there were anywhere between around 20 to 90,000 women who died prematurely from not having access to HRT wow. because of the protection it can offer for heart disease and bone mineral density loss, as well as obviously all of the other symptoms that we've talked about, you know, with the flushing and the mood changes and the way uh, the vaginal atrophy and the way that these things can impact their lives day to day. And the optimal time to begin HRT would be early in menopause, right? Before you've already suffered bone loss and all these other ramifications. Yeah. And you know, it's, I mean, the age of menopause does vary. The average age is about 51, but it's normal for it to start anywhere between ages sort of 45 to 55. Um, and I think it's, it's actually vital to think about if you're going to think about starting it then, because you are preventing it's a prevention isn't it so you're preventing the bone mineral density loss you're preventing the atherosclerotic plaques that we start forming because of the lack of estrogen in the body and how that's cardioprotective um, and it's it's a way of then you know essentially lengthening your uh, time where you're sort of functional and you're not having some of these problems mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and 
what is the composition, uh, like what is the hormonal composition of HRT? So it's basically a combination of estrogen and progesterone. Interestingly, if you have estrogen only HRT, then there's absolutely no excess risk of breast cancer at all. But the reason that progesterone is often added is to help protect the womb lining. Because if you have a normal womb and you just give unopposed oral estrogen, then you could have um, excess risk of bleeding and increased risk of endometrial cancer, which is why progesterone is given in combination with the estrogen replacement. Um, but if we look at, the, I mean, there's loads of different types and formulations of HRT. Um, but I do want to stress that if you're going for like the gold standard, which would be an estrogen gel or an estrogen patch alongside micronized progesterone, uh, then taking that for about five years, there was a there was a systematic review to say that there was absolutely no increased risk of breast cancer at all. Mm. So I'd love for women to know that, that if they want to look into it, they should. Um, it comes, as I say, in the form of patches, gels tablets um and uh yeah there's loads of different brands um but essentially it's just estrogen and progesterone mm -hmm. and what percentage of women currently are on hrt is it a low percentage it's low and it's increasing gradually i think it was probably at its lowest just after the 2002 study um it's gradually creeping up with a lot more awareness now about menopause and the symptoms especially in the UK. I don't know if that's translated over here um, in such in such a, a big way, but I, I get lots more women coming to me in clinic asking about HRT, mm -hmm. which I'm really pleased about because so many women over the years have said, oh, it's not natural, it's not for me. Um, and, you know, it's harmful. I'm worried about breast cancer. And, you know, I want women to know that, that it's, a, it's a very valid option. Uh, and it's actually, uh, you know, it's, the menopause guidelines suggest that it's the number one treatment for bone mineral density loss, as wow. I mentioned. Yeah, you mentioned the word natural. It, 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 there is an interesting thing within wellness and holistic health circles that, you know, obviously are going to prioritize natural remedies, food is medicine, et cetera, um, at the cost of medical interventions that could be helpful, right? So there's a weird, you know, in the Venn diagram between evidence-based medicine and, you know, lifestyle protocols and the kind of organic wellness, alternative, holistic health. Um, I could see a tension between those two things. Like somebody who's like, well, I'm just gonna eat organic food. You're saying, yes, but this intervention could be beneficial, but hey, that's not really part of my protocol. I'm trying to like not be on any, any kind of, exogenous interventions. Yeah. And that's something that I respect. If someone doesn't want to take extra hormones, then they shouldn't have to. And I completely understand that perspective. I think what bothers me is the idea that the choice of women is often taken away because of unfounded fears. And I think for me, it's important to be able to offer something that could benefit mm -hmm. and whether women want to have it or not is up to them. Mm -hmm. But we have to consider what's really natural, I guess, in the environment that we're currently living in. I mean, you could say it's natural uh, to die in childbirth because if you're in Afghanistan and you know, you're know you in a village somewhere, sure. you've got about a, a one in 14 chance of dying from childbirth. Is that natural? Well, yes, I suppose it is, but it's clearly not something that anybody would wish to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, when it comes to severe menopausal symptoms, but also longevity. Uh, I wanna be able to provide women with every possible option that is deemed to be healthy and appropriate. And uh, if they wanna take it, they can. Right. You mentioned earlier that uh, the age at which um, young women are experiencing their period is getting earlier and earlier. Is there also uh, a change in the window for menopause? Like, is that happening earlier also? No, so I think it may it may be again a reflection of Western society and the various exposures that we have. But uh, menopause in some cultures is actually seemingly getting a bit later. Um, there is some potential genetic differences as well. Um, Afro American women uh, will potentially African, should I say? I don't know what you say here. African American. African-American, yeah. black women. There are some potential genetic differences in when you would start the menopause anyway. So for example, uh, black women may find that they start their periods on average at about 48, 49. 
uh, whereas uh, white women may start on a, on average about 50, 51. But yeah, I think menopause can vary based on diet as well. There was an interesting study to show that eating more vegetables uh, could potentially bring the age of menopause slightly younger. Um, again, not dramatically, like maybe three months on average. They were mm. looking at sort of large population data. But I think that that's very interesting because, again, it speaks to the effect that our diets can have on our normal physiological processes. Is there a, a mode of eating or particular foods that could uh, lessen some of the negative symptomology around it? Absolutely. And I'd say, again, I'm going to bang on about fiber. Fiber is crucial um, and soy... Uh, Minimally processed soy products are really beneficial as well. Making sure that you have a nice variety of things like nuts and seeds for extra minerals like selenium are important. Um, even sort of things like, I know we haven't touched on thyroid function, but again, that's another hormonally sure. regulated organ. You want to be able to make sure that you're having great sources of iodine, selenium, zinc. And that's true for all of the hormones in the body, but especially for things like the thyroid. And what are some of your favorite foods that are high in those things? So with selenium, you could just have like a Brazil nut a Brazil day. Nuts. That would be pretty good. Yeah. But it's also in whole grains, um, whole grain rice, whole grain bread, uh, nut, other nuts and seeds. And the same with zinc as well, uh, which again is important for things like sperm production. I know we're not talking about mm -hmm. men, but sperm oh, we're production. we're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Um, there are loads of great foods. So just think fruits, veggies, whole grains, beans, soy products. I'm a big fan of flax seeds just because they're great at um, helping to improve the suppleness of blood vessels. And um, yeah, they've got loads of great um, omega-3s from plant mm -hmm. sources as well. Just make sure you grind them first. Grind Otherwise them first. Otherwise they pass right through. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's talk about male hormonal health is, is, you know, is menopause like a real thing? And also, you know, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on, on TRT because it's obviously the other side of that coin. Yeah. So I think that for men, I mean, I don't have personal experience of this, um, but certainly with my patients, it doesn't seem to be as much of a thing for men as for women. And I mentioned earlier, I think it's because it's a very gradual decline. Like with most of the hormones in our body, um, testosterone production can start to wane over time. Um, so, you know, I think in certain conditions it might be beneficial for testosterone replacement, but I don't see it as being something um, as vital for male health mm -hmm. as estrogen replacement would be for female health based on the changes in the body that occur for women that just simply don't occur for men. Yeah. I know so many guys my age that are on testosterone therapy. Um, I'm not. Uh, but they talk about it. You know, it's something that guys of my age, you know, tend to, to, are you doing that? Should I do that? Should I not do that? Are there negative health outcomes with respect to that? My understanding is that if you get on it, then that's it. You have to stay on it because obviously if you're taking it exogenously, then it's going to shut down your body's, whatever your body is, is making, right? Like it's telling your body, like, you don't need to make any of this because you're getting it. Yeah, I think this is where men should be cautious and speak to their own doctors about whether it's necessary or not, mm -hmm. especially if you're somebody that is actually hoping to perhaps father a child at any time. Because like you say, you're turning off your own testosterone production there, whatever it, you know, is still going on. Uh -huh. And that can have ramifications for your fertility. So I think that that would probably be the main consideration, um, depending on the intentions of the person that wants sure. to take testosterone replacement just to think carefully about if it could actually impact their fertility. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I Most think- Most guys my age are, pro are, they're not worried about that part. Yeah, probably Actually, not. they want the opposite. <laughs> 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 not yeah. everyone, but- Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's not something that is as prevalent or indeed I don't believe as necessary for men as it is for women. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a conversation that I think is occurring a lot more uh, in I mean, what would be spaces. the reason for doing it? Uh, probably to increase things like muscle mass, uh, uh, mood changes sometimes that can occur in men um, as as the testosterone levels that you're endogenous, endogenously producing fall. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think one of the main reasons that my patients would go on testosterone replacement is if they have um, excess estrogen exposures. Um, so it tends to happen more um, when men are carrying excess weight as well. 
that um, because, as I mentioned before, the fat cells can produce estrogen, which mm -hmm. can have a, perhaps a slight feminizing effect. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What else is unique to male hormone health that you can speak to? I think one of the main things that is worth talking about for male hormone health is uh, the gradual decline or the gradual apparent decline in sperm counts over the course of the last couple of generations mm -hmm. and the increased rates of something called hypospadias, which is where the urethra, the, the weed tube uh, sort of forms and grows on the underside of the penis um, and the increased rates of um, only having one testicle at birth. Uh, this is something that I suspect is related to, again, the plastics exposures in our environment, the phthalates exposures. Um, and that I, is think, a th I didn't know that that was a thing. An yeah. increase in men being born with one testicle. Yeah. What percentage of the I, population? I, I don't know the percentage. Significant enough that it's it's been It's been noted to be increasing. Wow. And again, as I said, the hypospadias issue as well, where mm -hmm. there's a sort of a distortion to the penis as a result of changes in um, the exposures in the womb, basically, because obviously the, this is the way that the baby has been born. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I do see that there is a correlation there between that and increased rates of exposure to things like microplastics, mm -hmm. phthalates, BPA, um, and it can potentially affect sperm counts too. So simple things that I think men could do that would be useful would be, I mean, studies have shown that vigorous exercise is quite good for sperm count, assuming that you're not putting too much excess heat on the testicles themselves. Because, like for example, with cycling or hot baths, because that can have an impact on the sperm production. But mm -hmm. otherwise, vigorous exercise is good. Um, sources of zinc and selenium, as I mentioned, things like nuts and seeds are really helpful. Coenzyme Q10, again, that can come through those kinds of healthy foods, nuts, seeds, whole grains. Um, yeah, and minimizing plastics exposures generally, which... I think probably the low hanging fruit would be to drink your water from glass rather than plastic to avoid um, something that's come in a plastic bottle if it's been sitting in the heat, mm -hmm. um, like in your car, if it's a hot day, for example. Right. Um, and you don't know, it could be in a, a, you know, in a cooler in the grocery store, but it had to be transported from somewhere. It could have been on a truck for days or weeks. In that's true. Excruciating Rich. heat. That's true. We but just don't know. Getting rid of plastic. I mean, it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. It's and so completely ubiquitous. I know. It's and crazy. I'd say it's almost impossible. I think recently there was a study to show that it's been microplastics have been found in the human bloodstream. It's mm -hmm. something that we we can't escape at this point, but we can minimize. And you know, I, I don't want people to come away from this conversation feeling scared. I think I'd rather they feel empowered to know there's a few things that we can do to minimize our overall exposure. And that would be heating. If we're using a microwave, for example, then just put it in ceramic or in glass as you heat it. You know, if you're drinking water, then drink it from a bottle. Maybe if you can invest in a water filter, do so. Um, simple things that mm -hmm. hopefully will over years accrue yeah. to benefits. What about the role of, of dietary fats and hormone health? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, I have read data to say that saturated fat consumption has been associated with lower sperm counts in men. So that's something of interest. Um, we also know that when you're eating a high saturated fat diet, then it tends to be mostly from animal products. And again, you've got those extra plastics exposures and things that can affect hormonal health from there. So it's hard to necessarily separate the two. Um, but in a more general sense, we have lots of data to show that a saturated fat-rich diet is very linked to things like heart disease. Um, and public health campaigns can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know that there, there may be listeners that think, oh, well, you're only feeling better because you're eating more whole foods and it's fine to have things like, you know, grass-fed beef and so on. But if you look at data from countries like Finland, for example, they, they had the highest rates of heart disease in the world back in the 1970s. They wanted to do something about it. They had a massive public health campaign. Many people reduced their red meat consumption, stopped smoking, ate more vegetables. And then, you know, moving fast forward about 20, 30 years, they managed to reduce the heart disease rates by 80%. So we can see that these are basic, simple things that people can do that can have tremendous impacts on our health um, moving forward. Right. Within the whole food plant-based community, there's varying opinions about um, the positive or negative uh, consequences of fats in the diet. 
We have the Caldwell Esselstyn camp, which is very low fat, no oils. Typically that protocol is, is something that's advised for people that are experiencing heart disease or have suffered some sort of atherosclerotic event. Um, and then there's another camp of people who are saying that's hyperbole, uh, a healthy dose of olive oil in your diet is fine. Like, how do you come down on this, you know, hot debate? Like this oh, is very divisive. It is divisive and I hate divisive debates. <laughs> so I try and stay out of them. I don't know if you noticed, but I don't tend to get into it online. Well, I'm, I'm gonna put you square oh, in the middle of it right now. You're gonna have to state your position. Okay. So my position is we have to eat more veggies, as I mentioned before. That's the number one. You're dodging that. That's a, that's a dodge <laughs> if I ever heard one. Okay. Looking at the data that we have, I think it's fair to say that if you're having good quality olive oil with polyphenols in it, it can have some health benefits. I don't think that um, having olive oil in your diet is an unhealthy thing to do. And I think a generally Mediterranean style of diet is known by many people, many nu nutrition researchers to be one of the best ways of eating for overall health, which includes olive oil. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that uh, for the majority of people having oil here and there is going to be at all harmful. I'm not somebody that thinks that seed oils are particularly harmful either because you know they, they are rich in PUFAs and MUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, which we know are health, um, are beneficial to health if you're replacing saturated fats in the diet with those kinds of oils. So yeah, I think it's, it's hard to sort of come down hard and fast, but I'd say looking at the data that we have, trying to compare what you know, one thing to another, seed oils have no demonstrable um, issues when it comes to heart health. But I would say that um, if you are aiming to lose weight, then it's not a great idea to have a lot of things like seed oils in your diet because they're very calorific and they don't mm. really contain a lot in terms of the nutrients that you'd be looking at to help fill you up, like the fiber-rich foods would. Mm -hmm. And also, I have a certain cohort of patients, certainly, that notice when they have a lot of oils in the diet that it can flare up things like um, inflammatory arthritis. And I think it would be remiss of me to avoid mentioning that, that certain people... Um, who have a whole food, plant-based, no oil diet find that it's beneficial for inflammatory arthritis as well as potentially beneficial for mm -hmm. heart disease. Right. So. And I would assume there's a difference between raw olive oil that you sprinkle on a salad versus cooking with it, like the oxidative impact of high heat on some of these oils. That's a whole different thing. It is, although I would say that the heat at which most people cook at home is not going to cause too much oxidation of olive oil. I think that's mm. that's something that's probably overstated. Yeah, do, what is the oxidation temperature point? Do you know? I don't remember, yeah. Rich. You put me on the spot there. <laughs> I stumped you. <laughs> yeah, um, I'd have to. Look I know that, that one up. like, well, you know, every oil has a different um, smoke point. Yeah, smoke point, right? Yeah. So coconut oil is much higher. It is. It doesn't but, oxidize until you get super hot. So it's sort yeah. of advised that if you're going to cook with one, that's the one to cook with. Well, that depends because mm -hmm. coconut oil also contains saturated, saturated fat. fat, which is still saturated fat, even mm -hmm. though it comes from a plant. So I think uh, if someone wants to concern themselves with the smoke point, then avocado oil um, is probably a good choice or um, cold pressed canola oil would be a good choice as well. That's always been the one, the number one enemy one. Sorry, but the canola data suggests, the data yeah. suggests that cold pressed canola oil is um, a, a pretty good oil to cook with because it contains the, you know, the um, unsaturated fats and it has a higher smoke point. So yeah, mm. well, if you don't want to cook with it, you don't have Controversy. to. Controversy. <laughs> um, in the, in the daily practice uh, uh, of being a doctor and seeing patients, what do you find to be, you know, when you're in this discussion around changing your lifestyle, maybe adopting a more plant predominant diet, what, and then following up with these people, like what do you find to be the common blind spots or, or stumbling blocks or places where people can go astray? I think our food environment is probably the biggest thing. So. We, we seem to have this feeling in the wellness space that we are all individuals and unique and we can make choices that 
are not unrelated to other things in the world. And actually, most of the choices we make around food are unconscious choices about, I think UCL research stated that there was over 200 unconscious food choices that we make every day and only about 13 to 15 conscious food choices. Wow. And I didn't know that we made that many food choices in a day, period. Well, exactly. But that's what fascinates me is to think when the research tells us that so many of the factors that control what we eat are actually out of our conscious mind, it's much harder then to make mm-hmm. changes for the long term that are healthy, especially if you don't have um, the, the mental bandwidth or the budget to think about these things. Having said that, we know that whole plant foods can be some of the cheapest things you can buy as long as you can get access to them. So one of the main stumbling blocks for me has always been people's habits and um, ability to have the bandwidth to make those changes mentally. Um, so I really start simple, just go for very simple swaps, find their favorite meals and make them with more plants, basically. Mm -hmm. Maybe get them to write down the favorite things that they like to cook and add more beans, add more lentils, add more vegetables, and then gradually crowd out the other things. Um, That's been one of my number one sort of ways to get people to eat more veggies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's, it's two main things. One, which you just referred to, Um, which has a lot to do with being more conscious about the environment that you keep. Like if you can create an environment where the healthy choice is the most convenient because you've cleared all the bullshit out of your cabinets and you only have healthy choices. And and when you wake up in the middle of the night, like, sorry, you know, it's gonna (laughs) have to be- You've got the munchies, you get your carrots out. (laughs) Yeah, you know, that Ben and Jerry's just ain't there. So it's about a conducive environment to making the better choice. But I think- perhaps even the bigger issue and stumbling block is really the social issue. Like people get all up in their heads about what other people are gonna think about them, what's gonna happen when they go to Susie and Dave's, you know, dinner party and they don't wanna make a fuss or I have to go on vacation with my neighbors and, you know, it's just gonna be too problematic and people like relinquish their boundaries or, you know, are are just too afraid to to stand up for themselves or to like make that conscious choice because they don't want to be difficult. Yeah, I can totally relate to that because that was my instinct, first of all, when I started on this journey. My main thought was, oh, this is going to be so awkward for everybody. People are going to think this is so strange. You know, it's, I think as social creatures, it's one of the main considerations that a lot of people have. Um, and... I guess it comes down to living in alignment with the things that you most want. Um, Do you most want to be somebody that pleases others? Do you most want to be somebody that lives in alignment with things that are important to you? Are those things one and the same? If you can have a conversation with yourself around the values that you're living by, it becomes much easier to then make conscious choices that are in alignment to those values. So I would actually encourage everybody to have this conversation with their loved ones or even just with themselves. They could write it down in a journal, write down their top values in life and how their food choices can relate to those values. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a lot easier because you're taking away a lot of the extra choices that you're having to make or the social situations that you're having to navigate because you are consciously living in alignment with the things that matter. So if it matters to you to minimize your risk of heart disease because you have a relative that died young, you want to see your children grow up, then you write that down and you find ways to make it work within that kind of framework, if you like, your values framework. Um, If animal compassion is important to you, it's probably a lot easier because you've already made that decision for another outside purpose. Mm -hmm. It's something that's outside of yourself. And perhaps the same can be true for someone that cares deeply about the environment and the planet. They've already made that decision based on a value that is so strong to them that it actually makes it a little bit easier to stick to. I think health overall is probably one of the first ways people go towards plant-based nutrition, but it's also one of the hardest ways to stick with it if that's your only goal, because it's quite Mm self-focused. Whereas if you can focus on something outside of self, then it potentially could make those choices a lot easier, either environmental health or animal compassion or reasons to stay healthy for others. It tends to be, in my experience, right. ways that make it stick a lot more. Yeah, that's that's a really good way of thinking about it. One of the questions that I get all the time, I'm sure you do as well, is I wanna do this, but my partner 
doesn't want any part of it. And you began this journey, Richard was doing it ahead of you, two different dinners, meals, et cetera. Um, but for a lot of couples, that becomes very problematic, especially when those values might come into conflict with each other. Yes, you're so right. And I think my advice from that, being the partner that was most reluctant, perhaps I can speak to this more, um, mm -hmm. is the idea that what I needed was, um, was patience and time. And sometimes people will never come around. Sometimes the people you love the most will never want to do the things that are important to you when it comes to diet. And I think that taking away that expectation is important because when you start to expect things of other people, that's where you can start to become very unhappy. You know, you have, you know, it, it builds kind of criticism in your mind. It builds comparison. Uh, it builds expectation. And that can be quite toxic for your relationship. So my best advice is just to do the thing that's making you happy. Do the thing that brings you in alignment with who you want to be and show your partner through your actions how much happier, how much healthier um, and how much more abundant you feel in your life. Mm -hmm. And then if they want to come along for the ride, they can. Right. But you have to be detached from that expectation. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to be vibing them all the time. And then that piousness creeps up and exactly. then it just becomes a disaster. Exactly. You've got to let that go. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to let that plan. go. Even if it's in the back, well, if I keep doing this, they'll eventually come around. They'll, it's no. No. You got to like get rid of that. I, I do think that that's probably the best way for you to sustain a healthy relationship with the people that you love the most. And it's hard because often the people you love the most may you feel need it the most, especially mm -hmm. if they have a health condition that could benefit from doing that. But you have to let it go because it's not your life. It's their right. life. I mean, that's advice for this particular scenario, but for, you know, a, a zillion others as exactly. well, like in terms of like partnership dynamics. Yeah. And in a partnership, you will often have expectations of a partner that are, are unspoken. Mm -hmm. And that could be true for any kind of scenario. Um, and that's not to say that you shouldn't communicate the things that are important to you. Of course you should. But it's the expectation that is attached to that, which I think can become very negative in, in the relationship. So letting go of the expectations of your partner is probably uh, the key to a happier life in all sorts yeah. of ways. Did Richard do that? Yeah, he was very patient with yeah. me. <laughs> in fact, when uh, at one point, I think, because steak used to be my favorite meal and burgers. I'd always order burgers when I was out and steak. I loved steak. And once he even cooked a steak for me, that shows how much mm. he loves me. Mm. Oh, strategic. Yeah, exactly. It's like reverse psychology. Right. So it was <laughs> in the back. Oh, if I do this, right? Yeah. Who knows? Uh, but that brings up an important issue, which is, you know, somebody who's listening to this or watching it is thinking, well, th my life is just going to become infinitely more complicated. It means like we're going to have to prepare two different meals. I'm going to have to spend all this time in the kitchen. I'm going to have to plan out everything in advance. It's probably going to be expensive. And suddenly my life, which was kind of going along pretty good, suddenly gets hijacked by this new lifestyle habit that is going to commandeer all my time, energy, and money. And is that the person that's wanting to start this or is this the partner of the person that's wanting to start it's this? The, it's the plant curious person who's contemplating the change, but now suddenly feels like maybe this is a little bit too difficult. Yeah. So it's kind of moving from contemplation to action that people mm, tend yeah. to have a stumbling block. Right. With. Well, they're hearing you and they're like, well, my partner's not going to be into this. So am I willing to rock you know, the boat? Yeah. Do this thing that's going to, you know, potentially cause. Um, fissures in my relationship and, you know, take up a lot of my time. Yeah. And those are valid, very valid concerns. And I guess what I'd say to that person is you have to find the thing that helps you know um, where you're going for the future. I think a lot of the time we kind of coast through and we do things because they are the path of least resistance. And Sometimes the path of least resistance is a great path and it works and everything's going well. But sometimes over the course of maybe weeks, months to years, we start to notice actually this isn't really working for me anymore. You know, although this is the easier route, I'm not feeling this. Mm. I either don't feel healthy or there's something niggling me in, in my conscience about things I want to do differently. And sometimes changes do require a 
a certain amount of forward thinking. And sometimes the biggest changes that we make in our lives are as, are as a result of pain points, things that come up in our lives that we don't like. <laughs> yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Pain can be our biggest teacher. And for those who are hoping to start making changes, but that pain point isn't quite there yet, then maybe they won't make a change. Maybe this won't be the right time for them. But my hope is that if we plant these seeds together today, some people will have enough water to plant, you know, to, to water those, those seeds. And mm -hmm. other people may have enough sunlight to provide those seeds with a little bit of sunshine. And maybe those seeds will grow into plants of change uh, sure. based on today. So the person who's sticking that seed into the soil right now and getting ready to water it, but doesn't know how to water it, like how do you think about the the early phases of this like i'm somebody who went all in that's just my personality type i recognize most people aren't like that uh i suspect you're somebody who would counsel people to make tiny changes master them like how do you get somebody engaged in this and give them some actionable advice about how to begin in a very practical manner so number one is literally write down the foods that you buy in your weekly shop Number two is write down all the foods that you make with those ingredients. And if you can find one meal a week that you'd like to have more plants in, then that can be your first step. Is literally just cook one meal a week that is plant-based and see how you feel. And then if that works for you, then you can cook another one and then maybe cook another one. Yeah, but all I do is eat takeout. <laughs> well, if you eat takeout, then... Interestingly, in the US, I don't know if it's the same, but in the UK, uh, we have a, a pretty good plant-based um, ready meal range in a lot of our supermarkets. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, I had a patient who was elderly, type two diabetic, never cooked for himself. And I said to him, why don't you just swap that one ready meal that you buy for this ready meal, which has all plants in it? Um, and in doing so, he was able to come off insulin and improve his type two diabetes. So there's always a starting point for everybody. If you're somebody that just eats takeout, then you know what, for you, the best thing would be perhaps just to start with one home cooked meal a week rather than trying to change everything. Just cook one meal at home rather than having all mm -hmm. meals takeout. Um, for my elderly patient who was just eating like small ready meals from the supermarket, switch to a plant-based one and see how you feel. See if it changes your health over time. So it's just, it is for a lot of people about those baby steps. Yeah. Um, for others like you, they jump in and they'll get started and they'll figure it out along the way and they'll enjoy that process and that's great. But for most people, it's just little steps. And you know, there was research by BJ Fogg to show that only one like one change is enough to then start changing, that, right. shifting the identity and then sort of adding in something new after that. So yeah, just one thing. One thing mm. is all you need to do. I'm getting BJ Fogg in here. I've been going back and forth with him on email forever. Yeah. He's getting in here soon though. Um, yeah, I like that idea. I mean, I think, you know, in, in listening to you, I'm reflecting on, on some of my habits now and what I find myself doing from time to time when I'm busy or Julie's out of town or she's like, I'm not cooking tonight, I go get plant-based takeout. But you have to be really careful because when you're getting takeout food, you're not preparing the food. There's gonna be more oil in it than you think. There's gonna be more salt in it than you think. and if you're opting for some of these uh, meat and dairy analogs, like maybe not so good. Not all of them, you know, they're all, it depends on what, you know, because there's a, there's a spectrum in, in terms of health, you know, the health factors that are, you know, what these things are about. Um, but how do you think about the, you know, the Beyond Burgers and the Impossible Burgers and all of that kind of stuff? I like to be fairly practical in the advice I give to people. I think if somebody likes the taste of an Impossible or a Beyond Burger and wants to have it once or twice a week, then there's no reason why they shouldn't for the most part. Especially early exactly. in, the, in the transition. But then having said that, you know, there is interesting data emerging. Like there was a study that one of my friends did actually on a specific brand of um, plant-based meat replacement, uh, meatballs and mints. And in the study, families were given um, these meat replacements to use alongside the normal meat and other foods that they would prepare. And what they found is that in the families that had the meat replacements, they had a favorable change in their microbiome over the course of 
those, um, I don't remember how many weeks the study was, but it was perhaps about four weeks to my recollection. They had really great shifts in their microbial health from using meat replacement analogs. Mm. So I think we do need more research to understand the effect on the body, but we do also know that for, you know, in the majority of these meat replacement analogs, there will be less saturated fat. Um, there will be less or no heme iron, which are both potential issues when it comes to heart disease risk and inflammation in the body. And, you know, I think they are too easily demonized by a lot of people. Um, and yeah, that's that's my take on it. I wouldn't say you should have them every day, yeah. but it's the same with any kind of food. It's great to have variety and whole foods as your main go-to. But I think a lot of people are, are too quick to um, to cast off these meat replacements. Right. Yeah. Well, it, again, it's a spectrum. Some are worse than others. Yeah. Um, and there's a difference between health promoting and neutral versus deleterious to your health. Exactly. Um, I think what what is becoming a bigger issue over time is that now there are so many products out there that taste really good and you can kind of psychologically rationalize eating them like, oh, it's it's vegan, it's plant-based, like it's gotta be good for me, right? Yeah. And and wake up only to realize like you're, you, you know, you're just eating French fries and Beyond Burgers all the time. That's not a whole food plant-based diet. Um, and it becomes incumbent upon you to like really make sure that you're eating plant foods close to their natural state, as wide a diversity as possible, rather than deluding yourself that because you're not eating cheeseburgers, you're eating a plant version of that, that, so, you know, you're going to sidestep heart disease, right? Yeah, like, exactly. So, yeah, that's, and it's, it's hard. It's kind of like the stuff finally tastes good for the most part, and it's going to continue <laughs> to get better and better and better. I think what we're going to see is like a split. We're going to, we're going to have foods that, that are going to taste exactly like that thing, but they're going to be probably on the more unhealthy side. And then there's going to be other companies who are creating plant analogs to some of our favorite foods that are doing it with health in mind and lesser ingredients and and natural ingredients. And my yeah. hope is that there's a lot of focus and energy and, and money going into that right now, because I think that's what we need more of. I agree with you. I, would, I think that you're absolutely right. We want minimally processed, less ingredients, more whole food based um, analogs for sure. And the, the ingredients do vary really widely. So yeah, mm. I think... When you look at the data on plant-based diets um, and the healthy plant-based diet index, which was um, really interesting data, you, you see, as you pointed out, that if you're having an unhealthy plant-based diet with things like, you know, um, French fries and and um, ice cream and all the things yeah, that you can see. Coconut ice cream and yeah, Oreos and potato Oreos, chips. Uh, yeah, crisps, potato chips, all of that kind of stuff. You, you know, you're not going to reap the same benefits at all. And you're right. People can delude themselves. They think, oh, well, it's healthy because it's plant-based. Well, it's not mm. always. So what's your day in food look like? Oh, I love, oh, what do you call it here? Oatmeal. <laughs> I Oatmeal? call it porridge. What do you call it? Porridge. Oh, porridge. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what they call it in, what's your town called again? Where I live. Yeah. Buckinghamshire. Right, of course. <laughs> it's like the most <laughs> British thing ever. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In what part of England is it? It's, Surrey? It's not. I work in Surrey. You work in Surrey. Okay. Um, and I live in Buckinghamshire, which is kind of between, well, I live sort of near Windsor where the Queen lives. Mm. So that's kind of near where it is. You'd probably You just know. get more regal I know. <laughs> with every moment, Gemma. <laughs> well, I'm from Devon, which is not as regal. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. down by the sea. Yeah. Isn't that where Earthling Ed's good, like his fish, his plant-based fish restaurant is? Good catch or something like that? I don't know, but I'd love it if Devon. it was because Devon, Devon needs more plant-based options. I think it is. I could yeah. be wrong, but oh, anyway, so go cool. ahead. A day in the life of food. Oh yeah, so I forgot where I was going. Yep, so I love porridge. porridge. I love to put flax seeds and chia seeds in it, berries, almond butter. You've got a lovely mixture of whole grains. You've got your nuts, you've got your seeds, you've got your antioxidant-rich berries. So yeah, that's a real win for me. Um, and yeah, I, I, in my book, I've got a lot of wholesome recipes that are also kind of comfort foods, favorite comfort foods like mac and cheese, which obviously doesn't have, um, cheese in, mm -hmm. but it's a nice kind of whole foods version. Uh, I love things like spaghetti bolognese, but rather than using mince, I use, uh, lentils and beans. Um, mince yeah. is like meatballs. Mince in is American. Like, 
Oh yeah, no, I I don't know. Do you not have mints? It's like, mint, M-I-N-C-E, right? That's yeah. how you're spelling it? M-I-N-C-E. It's sort of like ground beef. It's like ground beef. Right. Yeah, but uh-huh. I don't use ground beef. Yeah, we don't beef, call it that obviously. here. What do you call it? I don't know. Crumbles? Crumbles? I don't know what we would call it. What do we, <laughs> what, what do we call it? Mints? We don't have a word for that. <laughs> Chopped meat? Chopped yeah, meat. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> There's lots of suggestions from all these different <laughs> yeah. corners of the room. <laughs> yeah, so I love, I love comfort mince foods. Mints and porridge. I eat mints and porridge. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't eat much mince at all. I right. just I tend to have Tap like beans mince. and lentils with my spaghetti bolognese. Um, I like burritos actually. I'm a big. Well, burrito you're in the there. right place for that. Yeah, I've seen. Yeah, we had some amazing burritos. We went to Cafe Gratitude. Oh, you did. I yeah. had lunch there yesterday. Oh, were you there? No. Well, today well, you were it there. Was the day before yesterday. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I missed you. No, it's good there, right? Yeah, it's really mm. nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do they have burritos? They in do. England in the UK. Yeah, we do. Mm. And what else? Um, No, that's not it. I've got lots of things. I love, um, I love a good curry. I've got a great curry recipe in the book. Uh, Cauliflower and chickpea curry, I love. Mm -hmm. Um, I also really like stews um, and that's kind of wholesome winter. I'm thinking of all my favorite winter foods because we've had a very long winter in the UK. But now we're coming into the summer. I do love things like salads. I add in um, things like tempeh and tofu into my salads. And uh, what else? And is Richard still the cook or do you cook also? Yeah, I cook. Richard cooks a little bit. Yeah, cool. Well, let's round this out with maybe some practical guidance to kick people um, into this kind of lifestyle. Like when somebody comes to you and they're ready to go, like what kind of words of wisdom can you provide to empower them to embark upon this journey with confidence and perhaps a few you know, practical things that they could do to make it work within the construct of their busy life? Well, I think the number one thing is, is think of simple swaps that you enjoy, which we've already touched on. Number two would be, again, to think about the values that are important to you. And if you could try and live by those each day, it really helps you with the food choices you're making as well as everything else. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe just three, just three values that would be really helpful. Um, I don't know if you have any sort of top three that you have in your head right now. Well, I was just thinking if I was you and I was seeing patients and I knew that they could come back and make another appointment and follow up, I would try to, because I'm competitive, I would try to find a way to gamify it. I'd say like, well, here's your numbers in these categories. I wanna see them go down 10% in each. So I want you to come back in 30 days and 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 we're gonna do it again. So it's, sort, it's almost like goal oriented, like yeah. it's very practical, like here's what we're driving towards. And if you can come back, you know, every 30 days or every 60 days or something like that, and we can evaluate the progress, that creates a level of accountability and engagement. Yeah, I do that at work. Mm-hmm. I definitely do. And it's quite nice because you've got actual numbers to work with and you have a goal for people to, to have in mind. I think making making those goals specific and time orientated really helps. So, I mean, generally for people at home, if you want to do that for yourselves, then maybe you could get your blood tests done, your blood work done, and then decide, okay, in the course of four or eight weeks, I'm going to get to this number Mm -hmm. and this is how I'm going to do it. Um, But certainly my practice, I found that with my patients, getting average blood sugar readings, getting cholesterol or lipid panel profile um, or blood pressure readings, actually, they can change over time as well with nutrition. It's quite nice to then be able to have that accountability, to be able to bring them back and to encourage them as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I think for some of my patients, then gamifying it is good, but for others, they just tend to need that little bit of extra like compassion and care and you right. know, make sure that they know that I'm going to be there and I'm going to check it again when they come back. So yeah, it's yeah. a good strategy. I also think being being specific, it's fine to say it's okay to do this gradually, but how are you specifically going to accomplish that? Because to yeah. just say, well, I'll, I'm just going to try and I'm going to start eating more plants seems very vague. But if you say, listen, I know you love cream in your coffee. So for the next 30 days, you're gonna do almond milk or soy milk or whatever it is. And you're just gonna master that one thing. Like that's all you have to do is like that one thing. And it makes it very doable because, and it's 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 kind of like a go, no go thing, yeah. right? You can wrap your head around it. This is what I'm doing. Um, and then after 30, 60 days of that, it's like, okay, well, that's just, I don't even think about that anymore. What's the next thing that I can do? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that makes it more like, 
because the, the human brain is weird, right? And if you're just like, well, I'm just gonna eat more plants, like what does that mean, right? Yeah. And I think that that will wane in terms of how people are kind of consciously engaging with each meal and each food choice that they're making throughout the day. Yeah, you're right. And it's also so individual to people as well. Mm -hmm. So I could have one person sitting in front of me who thinks, okay, well, I can start with my milk. Uh, and I'll have someone else sitting in front of me that thinks, okay, well, I know I can just start with my breakfasts. And I'll have someone else sitting in front of me that thinks, okay, well, I know I can just start with two tablespoons of milk flax seeds a day. Okay. And then, so it, it really depends on the person, what route I go down yeah. based on what they feel they can achieve based on what they already are doing, which is, yeah, it's quite good to individualize it in that way and make it really super right. specific. I also think people future trip, I'm sure they say to you, I can't do it because I have to go to a wedding this summer, you know, in four months <laughs> yeah. or something like that. It's like, <laughs> that doesn't matter. Like, this is a sober thing. It's like, what are you doing today? Can your head hit the pillow sober tonight? That's all you have to worry about. What is your next food choice? When you, okay, you're gonna go to the grocery store today. Like, what are you gonna buy? Like just focusing on making that next right choice and not worrying about what you're gonna do tomorrow. Obviously with food, there is some planning involved, like you're getting food for the next day or for the following week. But to the extent that you can just be rooted in the moment and not freak out about like, the rest of your life or, oh my God, I'm never gonna have this food ever again. It's so Because I think that that really works across purposes with the goal. It's so true. That is so true. And I think about that in other aspects of, of life as well. Um, you can generally manage to do something just for today. You know, you can, you can manage to make the right kind of choice for your health and body just for today. Mm -hmm. Or you can choose not to feel angry just for today, or you can choose not to worry about something just for today. Um, yeah, and this is a slight tangent, but I actually have this daily mantra that I do, which is exactly that. It's in Japanese and in English, it means just for today, do not be angry, do not be worried, be grateful, do your duties fully and be kind to all living things. And that is the mantra that I actually repeat to myself twice a day, every day in Japanese. And it's just for today. Well, you know what I'm gonna say right now. <laughs> I'm gonna make you do it in Japanese. Okay. Oh gosh, okay. The fresh is on. Kyo dake wa ikaruna, shin pai suna, kan shashite, kyo o hagame, hitoni shin setsuni. That's beautiful. I think that's a good place to end it. I can't imagine a better ending than with that mantra. It's called the Gokai. The Gokai? Mm -hmm. Where did you find that? It's part of my Jikadan Reiki practice, which is a whole other topic mm, that's of a whole other. Yeah, that's a whole, <laughs> I, I know a little bit about that, but that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. Next so time. The next time, next time. But yeah, yeah it's, it's a call. great way of living, being, thinking. You don't have to put pressure on yourself to be your best self every day. Just try and do it today. The Plant Power Doctor paid a house call today and I think we're all the better for it. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Rich. Yeah. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, I appreciate you. The new book is The Plant Power Doctor, available everywhere. Mm -hmm. Pick it up. It's, a, it's, a, it's quite an accomplishment. A beautiful book, beautiful photographs, plenty of recipes, but amazing takeaways to improve your life on the daily. Thank you. So, I wish you well and come back and talk to me again sometime. I can't wait for the next time. I got to make it out to London. Yeah. I'm trying to figure that out at some point. When you do, so. I'll be there. We'll both be there. We'll cook you amazing food. You can stay with us if you want to. Excellent. In 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 Buckinghamshire. In Buckinghamshire. <laughs> I feel like I have to see it now because <laughs> in my mind, there's, you know, just, you know, beef eaters everywhere and, and you know. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's um, well, Windsor, yes. We could take you to Windsor, which is only uh, a 10 minute drive away and you'll see beef eaters everywhere there. Mm. <laughs> Good, that's a promise. Um, and final thing, like if people wanna um, learn more about you, what's the, where's the best place to have them go? Um, pretty, you do a lot on Instagram. I do a lot on Instagram. Yeah, Plant Power Doctor on Instagram, but my website's got loads of free resources, gemmanewman.com. Mm -hmm. So yeah, check that All out right. as well. All right, thanks. Peace. Peace and plants. Plants.